All right, welcome back to Rep by Rep Strength Podcast. And today I'm sitting down with Dominic Rowden. Is that pronounced that right? Did I get it right? Yeah. All right. You're actually the first person to pronounce it right. Most time they call me Rodin, Dominique, and all that. So thank you. <laughs> all right, man. I got it on the first one. We'll, I'll take that one. But uh, anyway, um, yeah, man. So you're a competitive powerlifter, running your own business. Tell me a little more about that. Yeah, so I am a 83 kg powerlifter. I've been doing powerlifting for about, man, four years now. So uh, I've competed on the national level. I am a North Carolina state record holder in the USPA Federation, and I'm currently competing in the USAPL, which is the Drug Tested Federation. Gotcha. And then uh, I am the creator and founder of Rise and Shine Lifestyle, and that was established in 2015. And... Uh, it's just incredible to see the journey. We are we have a online coaching business where we uh, take athletes under our wing. We have fitness apparel. We have a YouTube channel. We're just trying to do it all. Mm-hmm. And then I am currently going to school for physical therapy assistant. Uh, that's something that I've been kind of doing under the radar for a little bit. Uh, let me see what else. Uh, that's all I can only think about right now. All right. Yeah. So yeah, why don't you? Why don't you give people some idea because I, I don't think people quite understand when we're talking about competitive powerlifting. Like, would you mind yeah. giving us your, your your best numbers? What's it mean to be an 83 kilo guy? Are you walking around at like 95 kilos and then cutting down? Mm-hmm. What's that walk? What's that look like for you? Got you. So pretty much powerlifting is based off three main movements. It's squat, bench, and deadlift. We're tested in competitions um, for, you know, depth. And uh, pretty much just our overall strength. My best, my best lifts right now are a 635 pound squat, a 350 pound bench, and about a 620 pound deadlift, all at about 181 pounds. All right. So and as an 83 guy, as yeah, as an 83, okay. and I'm, I'm still a junior, so I'm only 23 years old. And <laughs> um, yeah, yeah wow. so trying to hang in there with the big dogs. Um, but I think my next meet is November 7th. And I got some big goals. This is like my last meet as a junior. So I'm trying to end it off with a bang and go out there and have fun and put up one of my best totals to date. Okay. So how are you feeling about your, your taper right now? Uh, taper's feeling really good. We're, I'm currently sitting around like 188 pounds this morning. So this is the lightest I've ever been um, going into like a competition. Most of the times I'm like weighing about 191. Uh, in the off season, I get to like the heaviest I got was 200 pounds. But this this time around, I really wanted to stay up on my nutrition and make sure that I didn't get too heavy, so that all the all the strength that I was getting can carry over to my actual lifts when it comes to the competition day. I got you. So is it a more gradual taper this time with your nutrition since you tweak some things? Or oh, for sure. I mean, just been tracking in the off season, not getting too crazy. I think it's it's pretty easy to like want to go balls to ball and like, eat a whole bunch of calories. <laughs> get strong, get big and put on like, you know, decent muscle, but you're also putting on a ton of fat as well. And right. uh, when you have to cut down and do like me personally, I do a water load. So mm-hmm. kind of like a, it's an old fashioned style. Like a lot of wrestlers do it, but it's pretty common. And what we do in powerlifting, we're like, I may water load like 10 pounds just to make it to the weight class. <laughs> yeah. Holy cow, man. So are you doing like any kind of diuretics to, to do that final cut or are you guys allowed to do that at all? We actually are. I, I think it's more of a preference with me. I, um, the best approach has been like, you know, getting down to about six pounds to where I need to be like over the weight class. And then just doing like a basic water cut. I've done the diuretics. I've done like all type of stuff. And those to me tax my body way too much to where when I need to, like when I need to rehydrate, it's very hard for me to get back to that training weight that I'm, I'm used to staying at. Right. I got you. So what, what kind of tweaks did you make from a nutrition standpoint this time around that you're doing differently for this prep? So the biggest thing was just really taking in control of like just being on point with my macros and cutting my carbs a little bit. Like I've learned with my body, like especially in powerlifting, like you need those carbs for energy. Like you you need them for those big lifts. But when it came to me, I actually did a lot better on low, low carbs, higher protein and moderate fats, which kind of helped sustain my hunger, Mm -hmm. which allowed me to like have better training sessions. And then I would always do like a big refeed before my heaviest days. And then I kind of just go on like a maintenance or like carb cycle throughout the week. And those have done my body wonders. Awesome. Okay. So with your, with your refeeds, what, what do those days look like? Are you mainly under budget on your calories and then the refeed is a huge surplus? How's that look for you? 
Yeah, like so I, I go pretty low throughout the week, um, especially right now because we're about four weeks out. So I'm feeling like pretty flat. And then once like once uh, I think Friday, because my heaviest days are on Saturday. Once we get to Friday, I try to go like maybe 300 grams of carbs, 350 to really just allow myself to get that not only that recovery, but just have enough to go to lay over into the next training day. But I don't do anything crazy. Like, I don't go like Krispy Kreme or like eat out at like buffets or anything like that. I've done it before, but um, it's just over time, you, you get to understand your body and what works yeah. best. And that like sometimes more is not always the best thing. Right. Because, yeah, I've heard I've heard some guys that and I've seen guys who will do that where they <laughs> they will just go balls to the wall and yeah. like slam a buffet. And some guys it works, you know, they, they say that that salt and that water kind of allows them an advantage. You know what I mean? Like gives them a mechanical yeah. advantage, so to, so to speak. But um, I've also heard some guys talk about how it makes them feel sluggish and slow and they just yeah. lethargic and it's harder to digest uh, certain foods. But Yeah, man, I think that you hit, you, you hit that right on the nail. Like um, to me, when you just like start eating crazily like pizza and you know just get that that sugar high like it doesn't ever do me well and i think you know with a lot of like uh competitive athletes they they take their nutrition seriously yeah. and they they try to make sure that whether it's a training day or whether it's meat day that every like all the variables are the same and that you're still right. just you know allowing your body to do what it naturally wants to do and not change anything last minute yeah i think that's what separates someone from being like advanced to like you know, a beginner is like, you start to slowly learn, like, okay, these are the things that I, I can control and mm -hmm. this is how I respond to it. And just knowing how to work under pressure. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I, I agree. I think a lot of people make the mistake of trying to control, trying to change multiple variables all at once. And then yeah. you're left. Well, what, what worked, what didn't work? I don't know. Yeah. You know, and I, I agree with you. I like to control as much as possible and then only change one to two variables and then move on, you know? But yeah, for sure. Have you competed in powerlifting? No, I've I've never competed. Um, you know, I I do enjoy it, and it's it's yeah. a reg, it's a regular backbone in my training program. Um, That's awesome. But um, no, man, I I don't want to go and embarrass myself with you guys. You know, I, I see some of the numbers you guys are putting up. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so, nah, dude. I think I think you could do it. I always um, ask everyone to at least give it a try because the the people you meet and the experience you get on the platform is like, it's, it's unlike like none other, you know, you're, you're really able to push yourself and you realize that like, this is something that is once in a lifetime, like the adrenaline and just the competitive aspect of it just really kind of draws you in and keeps you going for yeah. more. Yeah. I was probably the first guy that I learned anything from, uh, you know, it was Olympic based, so I learned snatch and clean and jerk, and that was kind of the, the backbone of my my training for a while was, you know, snatch, clean and jerk, and then squat, deadlift, that kind of thing were viewed as accessories to yeah. snatch, clean and jerk or whatever. So um, now what, what my training looks like is, you know, powerlifting backbone with snatch, clean and jerk once a week. Um, and Sorry about that. Oh, you're, you're good. I didn't hear anything. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, basically, uh, squat, squat, bench, dead, overhead press kind of forms the basis of my background of my training week. And then I'll snatch and clean and jerk once a week. Nice. So, but no, nothing like a formal powerlifting cycle. Like I'm sure what you're doing or whatever. So, uh, I respect all, all, um, variations of lifts and just like anyone that is going after a, a specific goal in the gym, like you got my support. Like, it's just really <laughs> cool to see people like push themselves out of their limits, whether it's CrossFit, um, bodybuilding, powerlifting, any of that right. is just, to me, it takes a different type of mentality right. and it takes a lot out of you. So to see someone, you know, push themselves day in, day out, like, dude, I love it all. So I'm not one of those guys that, like powerlifting is the only way or bodybuilding, <laughs> you know, like it's at the end of the day, we're doing something that makes us happy. Yep. And that's the one thing I try to focus on. Yeah. And I, you know, I think that's, I agree, man. It's, it really is, needs to be more cohesive and people need to come together and say like, look, we're all, we're all strength training here. Yeah. We need, we need to support each other. And, uh, you know, like yesterday I was talking to your brother this morning and, uh, yesterday I hopped in on these, these sled pushes with these guys. Oh my I, God. I hate, hate sled pushes, man. It just, Same. 
it destroys me. But uh, yeah. what was cool was like, even though we were doing a team competition, was just the camaraderie that everybody had and like the positive yeah. positive support. So like, even though even though you're competing, everybody's you know cheering for each other, rooting for each other, saying you know because we're working towards getting out of our comfort zone. Is the whole point, you know? Exactly. And um, I've met some of the most incredible people in my life just through the gym. Uh, yeah. I met some of my best friends and uh, just had some of the most incredible experiences because we're all, we're all, we are all in there for the kind of like the same goal and we can all come together and be like, we're pushing ourselves and the bar or the weight does not care what you look like, what you've right. been through. It's going to treat you the same, like 400 pounds is still 400 yep. pounds. So 100%. You can go in there and, and someone like who lives a whole different life, you guys can come together and just like have something in common and build that that relationship. And um, it's just been really cool. I mean, look, you you met my brother who, uh, you know, I'm very close with and he allowed me to uh, connect with you, which is like it all goes hand in hand all because he's doing his fitness thing and you've been doing yours. And it's just really cool how like how small the world is when you think about it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's so is that kind of the basis of you know, why you started RSL and, you know, you're wanting to bring people together. What's, what's the background here? Yeah. So rise and shine. Funny enough, uh, when I was a little kid, it started with music. So me and my dad did music as a kid growing up. And, um, at nine years old, unfortunately he passed away of leukemia. Oh, so, and sorry to hear that. Yeah. So, and that was like a huge turning point in my life. Mm-hmm. And what's crazy is like rise and shine was going to be his album name. So when I was like a little kid, I was nine years old and I kept, I keep, I kept seeing like his picture and um, like that was his, his little quote before he passed away. And I was like, well, I like that. So before it was just me like living out his legacy mm-hmm. and I wanted to do like I wanted to, to do music and all that stuff. So but then over time, it became more of like a fitness thing because I started, you know, uh, getting more into my own habits and things that I like. And fitness was like a big part of my life. So right. then it became something I just wanted to put on a shirt. Um, and then from there, it just kept growing. And uh, it became deeper whenever I lost my grandmother who raised me on my 19th birthday. Um, That was, again, something that really affected me. And then the last, the biggest part that really changed me was when I lost my biological mother, uh, October 31st in 2017. So like Rise and Shine started from just being like a legacy for my father to Mm -hmm. my mother, my grandmother and my father and just making them proud and trying to show everyone that it's not what happens to you, but it's how you it's how you respond and that we can all come together. Whenever I see someone like wearing the brand, I want them to know that like we're family and that it's kind of like their badge of honor saying, I went through something that should have took me out, mm-hmm. but I'm here now and I'm here now and I'm standing and I'm, uh, I'm doing something with that pain and turning it into good. Wow. Yeah, yeah man. I mean, hats off to you. I mean, that's incredible that you've, you know, pushed through that. Cause it, I mean, either one of those things could have certainly, someone could have used as an excuse to not do X. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, you know, good for you, man, for making it a positive, positive outlook on it and choosing to, you know, have a little salute to family members, you know, that's, that's awesome. Thank you, man. It's crazy. People always think it's like after a song, um, the song by J Cole called rise and shine, but like, it's just deeper than that. It's, it's a quote that I live by. And and, uh, I actually have it tatted on my chest. Um, rise and shine like it was my first tattoo when I was 18 and it it kind of just pays it pays honor to my father yeah. who kind of started it all and in a sense I'm just trying to make him proud and make my family that were so close to me proud but doing it in my own way and I guess I made a promise to myself when I was nine years old after seeing my father go through like leukemia and, and it kind of took it just broke his body down like I saw mm-hmm. from from the first to the end and I told myself like I couldn't do anything. So being a kid and seeing that, it was hard because I wanted to help, but I, I had no clue. You know, I was a, I was a little child. So I like made a promise to myself that when I get older, I'm going to do something that uh, is worthwhile and that I want to make an impact. And if I'm breathing or if I have the opportunity to, I'm going to help someone out. And then this kind of this whole movement of apparel and powerlifting has kind of helped me um, build that message. But it, it started off with, like with humble beginnings, you know, just like wanting like, – just a kid with the dream and we're slowly building it up and it's incredible to see the support. And I mean, like just you, like you're all the way across 
the country <laughs> and you you like something that we did out, out here in North Carolina and like that means the world to me. So now I consider you, you know, a part of that family, a part of that movement of someone that, you know, has you've probably been through a lot of things, but you you've uh, rose to the occasion and, and did the best of your situation. So that's why I try to look at it as. Yeah. Yeah, man. That, and that helps to definitely hear the uh, hear the background and hear the hear the story behind it you know because yeah. uh, some people will just well i just threw out a name and it sounded good or whatever like it's you know that's cool but um definitely more impactful when there's a deep-rooted meaning behind it you know yeah for sure but uh yeah so so you obviously like to help people i mean that's why you got into pta and um yeah. strict like coaching people online and that kind of thing so um what's that look like for you right now uh, it's going incredible. I, I was actually a personal trainer for five years. Five years? Yeah, about five years. Um, I started with the gym. I started personal training when I was 19 years old. Saved, I saved up some money, and I just got a certification. I just, like, balled out, and I was like, I want to do this, and um, got hired at a gym when I was 20 years old. It was called Fit for Life. It was, like, a local gym in North Carolina, and then started working there and built up my reputation, and then I went independent, and 2016 2017 mm-hmm. and I, I did that for about three years and then i just stopped personal training at the beginning of this year okay and then did yeah. you just move to exclusively online yes okay. um and it was crazy because when i did that i was so nervous i was like i don't want to do that like i love in-person training and then the coronavirus happened and i was like whoa like this is now you have to that time yeah, it was probably the best time to leave in person because like i was we we weren't going to see people for six months or so it was crazy Yep. Yep. So uh, where are you going to school for PTA? So I was currently going to Fayetteville Community College. And then right now I just moved to Raleigh. So I'm going to try to finish out the the courses in, I think it's Wake Tech. Wake Tech. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'm super excited about that. The goal is to start off there. Um, I was working as a PT tech for results physiotherapy for a few, for about for about a year. And I noticed that the tech and the PTAs did all the work. And I was like, man, these PTs go to school. They're incredible people. They're so knowledgeable, but we do the same thing. Like they just pass us off. So I wanted to be more hands-on than just doing the notes and all the billing. Right. Like, so that, that was my thought process. But right now, like the goal is to be a full PT, you know, it's, it's going to take some time and all gotcha. that stuff. But, you know, I, I think it's incredible. It's just to, I think personal training and uh, physical therapy go hand in hand. Like exactly break them down and then PTs build them back up. So it's, it's, it's really cool. Yeah. So how are you, how's that impacting your, your coaching with people that you're working with? I mean, is that the more you learn with PT side, is that affecting like how you're doing evaluations and that kind of thing? Or how's that look? Yes. It, it, It goes hand in hand. Like just being able to, um, educate myself on, more of the physical of the physical therapy aspect has helped me become a better trainer because like, I'm, I'm now able to handle injuries uh, and test them on myself and talk about them with clients. It's kind of like making it, it's making it a one stop shop instead of referring people to someone else. I can, you know, um, do more with them and give them a clear understanding of like I can help you build up and I can also help you with, you know, little nagging pains and uh, pains and discomfort that you may get over time with training. And uh, I've applied a lot of the stuff that I've learned from being around these PTs with mm-hmm. myself because I've been injured, hurt myself countless times. I can't even tell you how many times <laughs> I've hurt myself. So all those cool lifts you see, man, it, it took a few um, hurting knees, hurting backs to get those those lifts, but uh, it's all been worth it. Yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, man, I, I think back to some of the stuff that I was doing at, at different points, like early on before I really knew anything at all. Yeah. And, you know, just going in the gym and like, I remember one time I was doing snatch grip deadlifts and, uh, first, first, dude, first time doing them, first time learning them. I'm like, all right, I got the basic mechanics. I might as well just see what I can do for a one rep max. <laughs> just like, you know, and sure enough, man, just my low back, I, I will never forget it. I was, I was just doing a one RM and just like low back just goes pop, 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 pop. Oh my God. And, you know, you start sweating immediately because of the pain, you know, and, and you don't want anybody to know because you're embarrassed. Yeah. You're like, I'm good, but like, you, you can't walk. Yeah, like, you, you know what? Like, I, I'm just good for the day. I'll see you guys later. Oh man. But you know, that's, that's one of my all time stupidest things that I 
have done in the weight room. So <laughs> more power to you, man, because a snatch grip deadlift is already hard, but to max out with the max grip, man, it's, <laughs> woo, I can just feel my shoulders just hurting the whole time. I'm just thinking about it. But yeah, what was that? Uh, now you you said something about your hurt knees, hurt back. So what what have you had in the past? Man, um, so first off, I dislocated my shoulder. I've been working out since I was 14 years old. So I'm going on that almost on that 10 year mark gotcha. of lifting. And I think when I was 15 years old, uh, I was lifting with my grandpa in the garage, you know, just pumping the iron like OG style. <laughs> and, um, you know, like we, we had no clue what we were doing. We would like we would print off workouts from bodybuilding.com oh, yeah. and yep. stick them in the garage. And we do them like for two hours at a time. The same thing every week. And I remember I was like dumbbell pressing. And this arm gave out and this arm kept going. And when I let go, I let go of this dumbbell, but this arm right here just fell with the weight and it just popped it out. Oh so I like, I went online and popped it in myself at home and I never got it looked at until just recently. But, um, and then I pulled my back doing deadlifts when I had no, I had no idea what I was doing. Yep. Um, I've hurt my knees from just like over squatting or just all type of stuff, man. Power cleans in high school with the coach and the team it is, yeah, you know how it goes. High school yep. days where the coach is, you guys are maxing out doing power cleans and um, squat and bench. We didn't know what we were doing at all. Yeah, and that, you know, the coaches, man, I feel bad for them because they're at such a disadvantage. Uh, yeah. I think I think it is getting better. Like, I think people are starting to realize, you know, schools, especially in Texas and Oklahoma and that kind of thing, are starting to realize – look, we need a, a certified strength and conditioning coach here in the weight yes. room. And then we have yes. that, that guy needs assistance, you know, like for real, because if, we, if we've got 50 people in here, you know, one guy cannot possibly see everything all at once. So, Oh yeah. Um, and I, I think that's another thing about athlete education is look, there are no magical exercises. It's going to have to be what works best for that athlete. And mm -hmm. then you, then you program from a large group standpoint. Okay. The dumbest guy in here right now, how can he not screw this up? Like, how can I yeah. set this up so he cannot screw it up? Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, man, I mean, I think a lot of people have been – I'm guilty of it myself. Just like I was printing off the exact same bodybuilding.com workouts when I was 18, 19. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you you would think you would have to squat and bench and deadlift all the time. Mm -mm. Overuse issues and, like, yeah, you know, I don't know. I think everybody – I think – Every young lifter, especially if they don't have a coach, that's you do what you can. You, you figure out, oh, this is free. I might as well try it. And then you yeah, get I mean, it, exactly. Like everyone has to start somewhere. And I think one of the biggest things that people uh, tend to overlook is the basics. Just yeah. going in there and getting a pump, like doing a lot of bro workouts, they really do work. Of course, mm -hmm. you know, you have to evolve from those and get like an actual structured program. like whatever your goals may be, but having those basic fundamentals under your belt is going to take you a long way. Cause pretty much your whole lifting career is just longevity and doing the same things over and over and over. And then you start to see slow results over time. <laughs> yeah. And everybody wants those fast results right away. It's crazy, and, man. You know, like there's, there's a guy, he's outside right now, but um, it's like, man, I, I've given him a very, very basic program cause he's never yeah. lifted weights before. I said, look, Here's how you execute these these eight basic movement patterns. Do them for many, many, many sets of ten. Don't yeah. change. Don't change anything for a while. Oh, yeah, I, oh. I, I'm like, man, if you can, because that's one one big core principle I believe in is mastery of the basics, which are yes. is a lifelong pursuit. Like you're always yep. in, you're always trying to get better from a technique standpoint. Yeah. And you basically that's what I see from an amateur versus a versus a advanced is an advance is going to have an exact same uh, repeatable rep every single time. Yeah. You know, but if I give an amateur sets of 10, I know this guy's going to do sets of 10 and they're all going to look different, mm -hmm. but gradually over time, even if he's using the same weight, I want the, I want all of that set to look the same eventually. Yes. So he exactly. might, be, he might be five out of 10 looking the same right now. Then as it gets better, six out of 10 at that same weight mm -hmm. is an improvement. So, yeah, um, but everybody thinks there's something sexy and some kind of new program. It's, it's not boring, flashy, man. Yeah, yeah. It, it's strictly it's really boring. Like there's there's never going to be enough variations to get you a bigger chest. Like it's really going to just be like 
learning how to press better or how to activate that muscle or just doing more pressing. If you want to get bigger legs, you got to squat more. Like you have to squat. You have to, you, it's just the basics. You can't, you can't deny them. And, uh, you, you make a really good point of like just taking someone who is still learning and just mastering those, you know, those, those rep ranges and the form. Once you have the form down, everything else starts to slowly come in where you can start getting more fancy with it. Yeah, but most times people want a pill or, or they want some type of uh, advice that is like overnight. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think people have a hard time understanding delayed gratification. You know, it's that so is, good though. That's something like, I promise you, this is, this is what you need to do. Just stay the course. Don't, don't change other than like simply trying to put a little more weight on the bar. You yeah, know? exactly. Even five pounds or even if you don't add any weight on the bar, but moving it better, like each rep yep. looking the same that's progression or if you're not getting that fatigue through that same rep range that you did that's progression like but most people are like if i'm not maxing out every week then i'm not getting better and um to maxing out or just all that just takes so much on your body so i i always recommend take your time especially with my athletes i i'm the same way dude this is delayed delayed uh gratification is the way to go yeah so i mean for you like when i mean you're up at you're up at this elite level for juniors and you're getting ready to make that that leap into, you know. So what's what's the classification come next for you? So it's juniors and then it's open. Um, okay. Yeah. So I've competed at Raw Nationals twice, which is like the Super Bowl of powerlifting. And um, I, I think last year I got like top ten, which was really hard because so the the, the eighty three weight class, the eighty three kg weight class, is the most stacked weight class right. in all the powerlifting because it's that body weight range where everyone can be at like most yep. most men are at 181 pounds and then yep. you know if so like i'm five seven and okay. that's actually pretty tall for the weight class like most of the like the, the top guy is like five five <laughs> and so like i'm actually kind of at a disadvantage right now so and then like i should i should be in the 93 kg which is like uh 205 i think something like that yeah um but I'm slowly allowing my body to get up there instead of just like trying to add up, add all this weight on that. I'm not really going to hold. Um, right. But yeah, once I transition this year, I'll be in the open and the open is against like uh 24 and up. I think 24, once you get to like 40 is when you're, you're uh, considered a master, but um, it's just, it's been a long journey. I started off as a 74, which is a 163 pound guy mm-hmm. to uh, two years ago. I got into the 181 then. It, it was hard because I was so used to like keeping a, a decent physique, right? And, but but my strength plateaued. So once I allowed myself to gain that muscle, and I was like young, I was thinking like I want to stay light the whole time. But I I was slowly kind of digging myself into a hole. So once I transitioned to the eighty threes, it uh it changed everything forever. And like I'm just now starting to I feel like put on that that mature muscle, right? Or, or that man muscle kind of I feel like. <laughs> that man muscle. Yeah, um, I feel like I feel like everyone that gets like twenty five and thirty, like you're just swole, like you're automatically <laughs> just swole. You keep doing it. <laughs> it. It is interesting though. Like you'll see those guys that just have like a more dense look to them, you know. Yeah. And I, I think it is just. I think you're right. I think it's just it comes with the experience and the time and the tendons and ligaments get a little a little thicker. Muscle obviously gets a little more dense. Mm-hmm. At least it has a harder look to it. But uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, so with your with your training, it's obviously changed over the years. And you mentioned fatigue a minute ago. So how frequently are you going like 90% plus on your deadlifts, for example? My deadlifts? Honestly, I haven't pushed my deadlifts at all this whole prep. Like, so the most I deadlifted is 600 pounds. Yeah. And it, it was the fast, well, not in total, but in this whole prep of, I think it's been since, I think August, but yeah. it's been 600 pounds. And like, it's the fastest it's ever moved. but um, I think the most, the biggest movement that fatigues me is squats. Okay. If I hit a big single, oh my gosh, like I, my body's re- like my legs only have so much gas in the tank. And, um, what's crazy is in, in, uh, in meets, it goes squat, bench and deadlift. But in my training, I've been doing squat, deadlift and then bench, okay. which has been a lot harder. So I'm kind of priming my body for that big fatigue. So by the time I get to deadlift, I'm kind of. I have a break, so then I'm I'm a lot stronger. Um, no, but like I think we've been just hitting in the in like the mid, the high, five uh, hundreds, and we've only pulled six like a few times. So in about three weeks, we should actually see where we're gonna be at, and we're gonna peak our way in to hopefully 
hit maybe 20 pounds more than what than our all time best. Awesome. Yeah, and I, I, and that's why I was kind of asking you that that kind of question because I wanted to hear it directly from you about my guess was that you hadn't pulled super heavy leading up to the meet because I think a lot of people are under the misconception of oh well I got a deadlift I got a deadlift maximally all the time no. I got it I got it. but what a lot of people make a mistake of is this look you have fatigue that is going to set in so you have to ask yourself am I ready to make this trade off is it exactly. is it worth it to push one max single mm-hmm. versus where you could do three to four singles at like 80% and get a little bit more quality, a little bit more volume in that yeah. way. So um, I was just curious how that, how that worked out for you. No, it, so. it's worked, it's worked wonders. Like I think in the past with other coaches, we've pushed, we've kind of pushed things too quickly and it caused things to um, kind of shit the bed towards the end of like meat prep when it's most crucial, because when you go too heavy, too quickly, you're setting, you're setting yourself up for failure. Like you're not yeah. going to give your body enough time to, recover and you're not going to hit your peak because you're too fatigued to do anything like if you're fatigued on your last month when that should be like your prime um sessions where you're like getting stronger your body's slowly uh recovering better and you're just getting ready for that big day but you're like tired all the time and you're you're missing lifts you're, you're you're missing sets that's when things start to go haywire and uh with my new coach i don't know if you've if you're into like all the piloting, but his name is Marcellus Williams. He's called the Swole Fesser on uh, IG. Shout out to you, man. He's he's a great dude, really smart guy. He's like the guru when it comes to piloting. But um, he's he's given me a different approach where like we have kept the intensity super high and we just maintain that for months. Even mm-hmm. even in the off season, we weren't doing that much. We were doing volume, but it was broken up. Like instead of doing like a four by 10 we'd like do a heavy day a secondary day and then like kind of like a like a throwaway day where like i'll do a heavy squat i may do like a tempo and then i'll do like high bar so okay. it's like i'm practicing these movements but it's doing things that will uh keep fatigue off me if i am hitting my rpes right and rpes is just rate per exertion yep yeah yep. so just we've been using the rp method and it's been doing really well whereas in the past i've used like percentage based yeah and uh it's kind of it's easy to get fixed on a number, yeah. And uh, you chase numbers in this sport, you tend to kind of like overshoot all the time. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's one thing I've been I've been implementing with guys here is uh, more RPE style. And you know, nothing against percentage base. I think it certainly has its place, and it's definitely yeah. it's it's certainly worked really well for a lot of people. But uh, I just give it to them as like a rough skeleton, and. Yeah, basically, like if you need some rough guidelines, you know, here's your percents. But if you're a really good tester, it's going to skew your numbers. If you're a really poor tester, it's going to skew your numbers. And what if on test day, stuff's just not going right? You know, it's it's much easier to say, you know, hey, how you feeling today? If you're feeling good, like you're obviously experienced enough where you can implement RPE and you're going to get great results from it. You know, Mm -hmm. but for the beginners, there there are those coaches who will shit on. RPE for beginners and they'll say, well, they have no perception of difficulty, which is true. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, it's just here, let's, let's take your one RM, which is probably an artificial environment anyway, because you're going to have people who are shouting at you, yelling at you, you know, get, getting you hyped up, which is going to give you a false 10% or 20% buffer, you know? Yeah. So then that's why you take that 10 or 20% off depending on training age and whatnot. And then you have, a training max for that cycle, yep. you know, but, um, anyway, that's, that's so cool that you use RPEs on your athletes out there, man. Yeah. And it's, and with the guys that I work with, I think it, uh, I think it takes a little pressure off because yeah, highly, highly competitive, um, type of person that comes, comes through here, you know? So, uh, um, yeah. all these guys are there. I know they're glancing over and looking at each other, like who's lifting what. So I've been trying to create a culture here of, it doesn't matter what that guy's doing because you don't know his training history. You don't know his biological age. You don't know his training age. You don't know anything about mm-hmm. him. So what I give yeah. that guy is going to be much different than what I give you. So, uh, yes. yeah. But anyway, that's good, man. It, it's crazy how competitive we can get. Um, and being competitive isn't a bad thing, but it's right. bad whenever you let it consume you. And then you start to do things that are out of your character. Yeah. 
Yeah. I and think I, that's good that you're like not setting the the expectations high. You're kind of letting everyone do their own thing and, and like stay in their lane. Yeah. Especially for lifting, because I realized for what these guys do, uh, as much as as much as I hate to say it, lifting is the least important part of their day. You know, yeah. like they have more important things going on and um, I, they're competing in every other aspect. And here they just need to focus on quality of movement and executing movement well and especially being pain free. So um, anyway, yeah. I think I got off on a tangent for a second. but uh, No, you're all good, man. But yeah, what about uh, now? Have you ever messed around with any kind of accommodating resistance or anything like that? What is that in particular? Like so, like bands or chains or anything like oh, that. Oh yeah. Oh, so to me, I always think of like West Side. I don't know mm-hmm. if you ever heard of Louis Simmons. Oh yeah. Yeah, I actually got to meet Louis in 2018. Super awesome guy. Um, yeah. He invited us back to his gym whenever we want to go. Me and my friend um, Jamar Royster and my coach at the time, Mark Mike Vargas. Um, but really knowledgeable guy he definitely believes in it but i kind of dabbled in that a little bit uh, in 2018 but then i kind of strayed away from it because uh i think there's a time and place for everything um Mm -hmm. in the off season i think it's great to push yourself and use those resistance um but i think it all kind of just depends on what your goals are man it goes it always goes back to that like I think it's great though, but I, I personally don't do it anymore as much. Yeah. What are your thoughts on it? Yeah, man. I mean, I think it's, it's one of those things like I've played around for a little bit with it just to see what it's like. Um, yeah. but yeah, I've talked to some highly competitive power lifters and there's kind of a mixed bag of results. Like some guys will say it works great for me. Other guys will say, no, it doesn't. Um, yeah. So I think the, the jury's still out and it's kind of one of those things where, um, whatever your bias is or wherever you're leaning, you can probably find some evidence from some really smart people to support your yeah. position. So um, it really is like, look, the most important thing is the placebo effect. Not saying it's strictly placebo, but if you think it works, it works. You know, exactly. there, there's no debating that. But um, yeah, like I, I have messed around a little bit with uh, uh, like weight releasers and that kind of thing. And those are fun. Oh my gosh. Those are around. brutal. Yeah. <laughs> those are those are brutal, man. Like, see, I see stuff like that. I'm just like, that's insane because yeah. it would mess with my head. But yep. it's also, I think it's a good confidence booster because when those things come off, you're yep. like, oh, this is light. But, you know, it feels like super heavy on, on the back or on the chest. But uh, I don't know. I, I've met a lot of powerlifters that are diehard, like West Side only or resistance yep. bands change. Uh, and it works. I mean, they get strong, but again, I think it goes back to like the mindset. It's a placebo. Like if they believe in it, you're going to obviously excel. But whereas if I don't believe in it, I may not as do as well with it. So. Yeah. And you know, the, uh, you know, now that I think about it, there's a uh, buddy of mine that I had on uh, a couple months back. His name's Mike Lawrence and he's competitive power lifter. And oh, I, I can't remember if he's, I can't remember if he's geared or raw, but Either way, I mean, his deadlift's like around 740, 750. Um, but he, he does a lot of accommodating resistance, and he's a professor, University of Maine, I think. Oh, that's so, incredible. So he studies a lot of that stuff. But um, So he's not just like a professor who's saying this theory. Like he's, yeah. actually, he's actually, let me experiment and try and then like report back and do some experiments, you know. Mm-hmm. But uh, anyway, he's, he's had some great results with it. So, uh, but then I sense. talked... You said 750 deadlift? I think he's I think he's somewhere around there. Man, I think his name, if you check him out on Instagram, it's like the Albino Rhino 275 or something like Sounds that. Sounds super familiar. I don't know why, but I'm going to check him out for sure. He's jacked, man. He's he's a big dude. So um, anyway, it's it's just interesting to talk to him about it. And he's I mean, you you guys would get along for sure. I mean, powerlifting, powerlifting, you've got a lot of raw work, and then he's got mm-hmm. a lot of uh, I think he's done some gear stuff, but I think he might get gravitate a little bit more towards raw as well so yeah geared lifting is a whole different world i have right. a few friends that do it but um I, i've had my friends wrap my knees and never again that thing no it hurts oh yeah. my god i tried i had somebody wrap my knees one time i'm like hell no i'm not not doing that anymore and my girlfriend sucks. loves it like she she's she loves uh geared lifting which is crazy and she's oh, awesome. she can so she competes yeah she competes that's awesome man what's what weight class she she competes as a fifty two and a fifty seven. Oh my god! So she's like super tiny. 
<laughs> yeah, she's a hybrid, but she's just like a monster. Um, yeah. Yeah, so it's really cool how we can share that together um, too. So you guys in the gym at the same time? Yeah, like we're so we're in the gym at the same time. We both do really long workouts, and it's been good to find a partner that understands the lifestyle because we we do take it pretty seriously. But I I'm big on like once I stop having once I stop having fun with it, I'm probably you know gonna uh, leave that leave powerlifting at the door. But right now I'm I'm enjoying it. Like I I want to make sure I have fun and I uh, am in it, that I'm progressing as well. But I don't want to ever take myself too seriously with it, you know, because yeah. we're not getting any, like we're not Olympians, nothing like that. We're just people that enjoy the camaraderie of the sport mm-hmm. and the feeling we get on the platform. But yeah, she she's been competing for about two years and um, she's very strong. She's probably gonna no, she will be on the prime time stage next year, uh, which is like it's like the best of the best in the country. Okay. Like, yeah. So is that gonna where is that gonna be held? Uh, so raw nationals is always held in different different states. I think this year it was supposed to be held in Florida, but it got canceled. Um, so I'm not sure where it's going to be at next year. Last year it was in Chicago, which was incredible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man, that'll that'll be cool. I mean, that'll be really exciting for her to get up there. And, you know, yeah, because how many are in that? Do you know how many are in that class or expected to be in that class? So when you're in prime time, I think it's like 10 lifters. Whereas when you're in like the normal session, it's like a hundred lifters. So you have to really be like top five or top 10 in the nation to make it. So, so does she know what number she needs to hit? Yeah. Yeah. Um, she's got some big goals. She's trying to, I think she's going for the American record on bench, uh, at her comp. And then, um, for me, I'm trying to go for the North Carolina state squat record as an 83 kg junior, which is like 630 okay. pounds. So, <laughs> luck, man, we're, we're, we're going to try to make it happen. Um, I think I got to chip it. So, like, I got to hit 640. I, I think it's 632. So, I got to hit like 642 in, in order to get it. So, it, it's, it's cool to have like a partner that pushes you in, in and outside the gym and yep. that we can have fun with it too. Yeah. Yeah, that does help for sure, man. Having somebody who's, you know, for sure understanding about, hey, this is going to take some hours. This is going to take some time. Yeah. So. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, she's screaming on the sidelines too. Like she's she's hitting pneumonia and she's doing all this stuff with me. So it's it's fun to uh, to have that in our relationship. Whereas sometimes it's it's hard to find someone that can understand, especially yeah. when you go to the gym. Like I think that's the, the hardest thing. But uh, it, it's been fun. Two years strong. All right. Yeah, man. I got yeah, man. when I first got up here I, uh, on my desk. There was a uh, there was some ammonia, and I I never smelled ammonia before. Oh my god! And <laughs> I was just like, yeah, I'll just unscrew this and see what it's like. Like, oh my <laughs> god! All right, that's going back on the shelf over there, man. <laughs> Holy you shit! Close it real quick. And yeah. Put it away. Like not smelling that stuff, but I've seen a lot of guys lift. A lot of guys smell that right before they go, and it works. Yeah. It does something for you, so. Uh, did you put it straight to your nose like yeah, all the no, way up no 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 i just oh, i just opened God, it kind of i kind of held it away you know and yeah thought my eyes were gonna pop out of my head yes but. it's great it's great but man some ammonia out there is so strong like you i've i've had ammonia that was so strong that i've opened the bag and i started crying like <laughs> it was that strong like the mail the mail packaging i was like whoa the mailman's like what the hell are you having me yeah, he's like, this, is, this is illegal it has to be <laughs> Oh man, but uh, well, hey man, I don't want to keep you too long. But um, anyway, thanks for uh, thanks for coming on and chatting with me for a little bit. I appreciate it. No problem, man. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, um, I'm honored, and I hope we can do this again sometime. Yeah, why don't you give me? Uh, you want people to have your your Instagram email? How do you want people to reach out to you? Yeah, um, follow me on Instagram at Mister Rise and Shine. Uh, that's on. Instagram and then our follow our official uh, apparel page, which is official Rise and Shine Lifestyle. I'm messing up this whole thing. And then on Facebook, you can find us at Rise and Shine Lifestyle as well. All right. All right. Cool, man. Well, have a good rest of your weekend. And uh, thanks for taking the time today. Thank you so much, man. Have a good one. Yeah, you too.